Folks, everybody, welcome to CS10 Lecture 20. <laughs> Distributed computing. We're talking about how to take a process of computation and to send it out to the world and get results back. And that's really exciting. Um, they always do a technology in the news, which was that we are now the fastest supercomputers, the fastest supercomputer clusters that exist at these uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs and Lawrence Berkeley Labs and, and, and other, uh, uh, other high heavy computation centers are in the petaflop range. The fastest supercomputer in the world, according to top500.org, is at 10 petaflops, which is incredible. You remember the numbers are like kiloflops, it's a thousand, mega is a million, giga is a billion, tera is a trillion, peta is a uh, quadrillion, and exa is a quintillion. Okay, So that's a lot of flops, folks. So we're at 10 petaflops, and they believe that in 10 years, which is not that far, they will get to the point with massive parallelization, by the way, which we're talking about today, they'll get to a exaflop. And that just that number boggles everyone's mind, and no one can wrap their mind about what that really means, what, what that number means, but it's it's incredible. I believe it's a billion billion. So it's pretty incredible. Okay, so uh, there is a little news article which is I talked about busting the king's gambit, and I, I, I sent the message on April fourth. We didn't have class on April first, so in fact it was an April Fool's prank. The size of chess is way bigger than someone with just even 3,000 cores could even get close to having that stuff. Even if you truncate the game when somebody's lost two pieces, it's still way too big to be able to, to handle um, by like many, many orders of magnitude. And so it kind of fooled me because I didn't do the back of the envelope calculation and hopefully it kind of fooled you. It's kind of, yay, April Fool's joke. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. So chess too big. Anybody claims to have solved it, even in this kind of fake way, no way are they, are they doing it. Unless they're talking about end games with like four pieces or six pieces. But no way can you do it with 32 pieces, which is crazy. Okay? Uh, so today we're talking about distributed computing. We're going to start with some basics of system. I, I realize that in CS10 we haven't really done the demystification stage where we explain to you how the system works, how computers work, how memory works and how we actually can go in parallel. So we'll talk about a lot of technical detail today. Hopefully not swap, but hopefully stay on the same page. So we'll talk about distributed computing. Uh, we'll do themes and challenges, and then I'm going to tell you a solution. And you're going you're to realize that the solution you already know. It's, a, it's like, ooh, I did it already. You know it already, and we're going to see it as our favorite map and our favorite combiner. And it, when they put together, you can control a million machines at once with that simple, beautiful abstraction we learned on Wednesday. So here is the memory hierarchy. There's a processor, which is the brain of the computer. And that we put it at the top, like the brain is, and you have levels of memory. Like, what does that mean? Well, the size of memory at each level gets bigger. The speed with the levels get, go down from being close to the processor lower away and higher higher up here and you also have increasing distance the same kind of idea and whoops in this picture let me give you an example at level i don't know level 4 you might have your hard drive a spinning disk with magnetic flurry on, slurry on top of it that stores magnetic charge at a very micro level and you all know what a hard drive is basically <laughs> level 3 might be oh, i want to know flash memory which you might have heard of, may not know what it is. You can kind of buy a USB stick, that's flash memory. Okay, So you might have that in your computer as there. It's going to be smaller than your hard drive, more expensive than your hard drive, but faster. There's three things that are true here for each of the levels up. The size, the cost per bit, and the speed. Okay, So disk, really big, really cheap per bit, but slow. Flash, a little bit more expensive per bit, smaller, but faster in terms of being able to read and write those bits, okay? Above there, you might have something called DRAM. You know when you go to Best Buy and say, I want more memory in my computer? That's called DRAM. That might be level two. Level one might be something called, these are, by the way, I wouldn't mind writing these things down. This, I, they're not on the slide. So flash there, disk is level three. And then level one might be something called SRAM, which is another kind of memory that's even faster than DRAM. So one of the things you're going to see in this hierarchy is you have the interesting property that as you have different technologies 
from SRAM to DRAM to flash to magnetic disks. What might be even below magnetic disks? Do you guys know how they used to back up disks in the olden days? Tape. Tape. What is it? It's slower. It's bigger. A tape can hold more than a disk usually can. And it's cheaper okay, per bit. So all those things are true for everything in my memory hierarchy. It's really cool. That's how a computer works. That's how that computer can give you performance at the level of the fastest level in level one, even though most of the data is being stored at level two, three. Because uh, what it says here, ah, here's my slide here. This is cool. So I was saying these things are on the second slide, which is if they're close to the processor, they're smaller, as we talked about that, faster, more expensive. And a su ooh, this is the key piece, a subset of the lower levels. It's like your rapid call list, like your rapid dial. My iPhone has, here's the top 10 people in my recent calls list, OK? That's a subset of everybody in my address book. But it's faster to get access to, OK? So it's a, it's a copy. A subset of all the data on your disk lives in memory. You guys know this? I don't know if you guys know this. When you run a program, it lives in disk. The program, what's the com most common program you guys like to run? Microsoft Word. It lives on disk. When you want to run Microsoft Word, it has to copy the data for Microsoft Word, the program, put it in memory. Do you know this at all? And when you're actually running it, some subset of that actually lives in, in our example, might it live in Flash. The part of Microsoft Word that's doing the spell checker, if you're doing spell checker, that will live in the smaller piece of that. And even a smaller piece of the spell checker lives in your cache, which is the SRAM at the top level. Isn't that amazing? It's a subset of the whole thing. And that way, that way, it's as if all of Microsoft Word is as fast as I can access SRAM, but in fact, Microsoft Word would never fit in my SRAM. So it can kind of give you the, what's the most important idea you learned in this class? Abstraction that you have memory abstractly is as, what's the economics of it? As cheap and as big as the lowest level at the speed of the highest level. That is an incredible abstraction. You know how slow a hard drive is in comparative terms to a processor? Really slow. A processor is in the nanosecond range, 10 to, 10 to the minus 9th. A disk is at, 10, is at the millisecond range, 10 to the minus 3. That's a million times slower. So from the point of view of like thinking, let's say I need some data. You have to wait a million clock cycles sitting idle until the data is ready. That's a lot of lag. That's a huge gap between memory or disk and your CPU. A huge performance difference. It doesn't matter because what's going to happen is I need to run a spell checker. Well, copy the data from Microsoft Word into memory. Copy the small spell checker into the cache, into a bigger cache, which is flash memory. Copy it from, or from real memory, DRAM, say. Copy the part of the spell checker I need, that's the part that's like how to spell the word lower. Copy that into my cache and how to do that part, and that's really fast. And in your mind, you're running all of Microsoft Word that fast. That's a really big idea, okay? That's the, one of the most powerful abstractions of all of computer engineering is that memory hierarchy abstraction. So you're learning abstraction in this course in many different ways. It's not about making a milkshake and not having to have three copies of it for the three different flavors or the generalization you've seen. It's not just about how to save yourself the details of writing a for loop because you're using higher order functions which take care of that for you, right? The i, let's make a new variable i, that's what we did last week. It's not only the fact that your computer does not cost a million dollars, which is what it would cost if you had to have the amount of disk space that you have, if that had to be all in SRAM, it would cost a million dollars. But the fact that your computers cost 500, 1,000, 2,000 is all of this abstraction that makes all of the economics of computer powerful. Isn't that cool? That's pretty cool stuff. And you're going to say, well, what if I needed the fastest, fastest, fastest performance ever because I was, let's say, Pandora and I'm streaming music and it's my whole company's business to do that. You know what you buy? You buy a disk. An abstract disk with a plug like a USB 3.0 or 2.0 port or something, or however the ports on the high-end computers are, maybe Thunderbolt on the Mac or eSATA. You have this port. In fact, it says disk. It says big. Somebody wrote in crayon, disk all over it. You know what's really inside? 
DRAM or SRAM. So it, abstractly, it's a disk. It looks like a disk, knocks on it, sounds like a disk. In fact, it's not a disk. It is that top, it's this top level filled the entire disk. That box cost a million dollars, but that box is the fastest disk you've ever seen in your life. Isn't that cool? And abstractly, it works like a disk. Your computer says, oh, disk, plugs it in, USB port, it works like a disk. But it's the fastest disk you've ever seen in the world. All because of this abstraction you can make between that interface. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Handouts are coming out now. Thank you for that. Okay. You've seen a little bit of the networking basics when Luke talked about networking. Um, in general, you have a source and a destination. Each source and destination have a network interface device or a network interface card, a NIC card. And they go to this cloud. The cloud has routers and switches, and they know how to make the connection. Somehow they know, just trust them, how to make the path and connection there. And it turns out that your data is going to be broken up into small pieces and sent out. It's like Tron. You may see Tron, where the human body gets discreted up, divided up into discrete pieces, and goes over the line, and now it lives over there. This is how this works. Your message, whatever it happens to be, you're downloading a file, watching a movie, gets broken up into small different packets, sent in the cloud, each packet could literally go a different way. Isn't that incredible? It's like having cats on the East Coast and saying, hey, cats, all of you million cats representing my movie, get to the West Coast, go. And they can all take a different path, literally. And half of them could die crossing a river. <laughs> no, not die. Could decide to eat, drink a lot of milk. I like cats, too. Could drink a lot of milk and not get to the destination because they're happy and they want to decide to live in Kansas for the rest of their life. And you say, well, how does that movie get there? Because there's an abstraction called TCP, which is going to guarantee delivery and check and say to the guy, hey, did you get all of them? And I say, and the person on the other side says, yes, I got the, you know when you get a letter and you have to like sign it to say that person, I got the confirmation, I got the delivery of that? That confirmation will not come through for those cats who are living in Kansas drinking milk all their lives. So I'm saying, well, I, I waited long enough for the, to hear the receipt of the confirmation of those cats. Didn't happen. I will resend the cats that didn't go out until eventually, and I will guarantee, and by the way, take a different route. Don't go through Kansas because a lot of milk there. And they'll take a different route. They'll go through Canada. It's cold. They'll keep running. And then they'll get to the West Coast. They'll be done. Okay? So that is a powerful abstraction. Again, abstraction in the networking idea. Okay? So networking and the idea that the computers are connected on this powerful, wonderful Internet has transform what you can do in terms of solving problems. Now, instead of using my only my own computer, which was always the case for many, many years, it was whatever I can solve on my own computer is as big as a problem I can solve. Now they realized, what if I could break up into problems and have other computers I can talk to via this wonderful thing called the internet, and they will help me with the problem and give me results back. And now, all of a sudden, I can solve way, way bigger problems. That's awesome, okay? So that's really cool. New, form, new forms of collaboration and network connected computers can really enable things. Like big problems. What big problems? How big can you mean? I mean, Word, you know, it can do a spell check. What else can it need to solve with computers? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Look at something like climate change. To have a climate model that has enough data and enough processing power that you can actually run through the Navier-Stokes equation of fluid flow and temperature dif differentials and how a cloud in, in Europe is going to affect our weather, which it will eventually. The whole thing is connected. The whole world is connected, folks. So some, there's some tornado storm that happens in South America. It's going to affect our weather in some subtle way. That model has to factor in the whole world. So what do you have? Well. You divide the world, which is a sphere, roughly, topologically, into the grid. You sample that down. By the way, Kathy Ellis is going to talk about this, I believe, on Wednesday. She's going to come and talk about that. So, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. That's Armando doing that. I think she'll come at the end of the year. Um, so, uh, the idea is you solve this fluid dynamics Navier-Stokes equation for every point in that data set. Okay? It requires, as it says, 100 flops. A flop is a floating point instruction like a multiply, a divide, an add, a subtract, okay? A very simple thing. That's a basic unit we talk about this, okay? When you hear, talk about flops, you say, Dan, you said this 10 teraflops. What is a flop? A floating point operation, okay? So weather prediction, which says, what are the constraints in weather prediction? It says, oh, seven days and 24 hours, okay? 
So to do seven days of weather prediction, 24 hours, how hard is that? You only need 56 gigaflops. Well, how fast is a real computer? Computers are incredibly powerful. Computers have been exponentially growing in speed. We know that. Exponentially growing in the number of transistors that you can fit in a microprocessor. That's Moore's law. The an Intel Core i7, the, hot, the top of line Intel as of this slide, is around 100 gigaflops, which is supercomputer land for five years ago. I mean, honestly, my desktop is supercomputer land for five or 10 years ago. And that's always going to be the case. It's always going to be like we, keep, we hopefully keep growing like that. So I can do weather prediction on my laptop. That's awesome. Now, how, that's, by the way, that's seven days in 24 hours, right? In 24 hours, I, I allow you 24 hours of computation, but you're predicting ahead seven days, right? That's what you, whether, you know, I don't care whether it's going to rain five, eight days ahead, just seven days, what's the, what's the status, okay? But climate prediction is incredible. You need, to, you need to predict things and have things updated continuously to see what, how the climate's going to evolve. 50 years, but I'll let, I'll let you compute for a month. I'll let you change the model, change the decision, change the input parameters, and then compute for a month. But you need to tell me how the weather's going to change, temperature's going to rise, seas are going to rise, all those things affecting everything, the whole entire ecosystem. That's 50 years of modeling. The amount of computation to do that work, given a month's time, 50 years of modeling is 4.8 teraflops. I can do gigaflops. Tera is 1,000 times that. Okay? So you'd never do it. Okay? You couldn't do it. So what do you do? The idea is... You ha on one machine. You can't do it on one machine. You have to use many machines at once, all contributing their piece to this big calculation. Okay? So far, so good? So, that is the idea of distributed computation. You distribute the computation step. You take your data. You ship it out to all the workers. They do some work, and they result, retort, report their results back to you. There are two, times, two kinds of distributed computation models. One is called a grid, and one is called a cluster. They differ only in how heterogeneous or homogeneous they are. A grid says that I have an Amiga, you have a PC, and you have a Mac, and you have a this, and you have a Commodore. That's a grid. Everybody has a different system. We're all going to try to collectively help with the problem. But I can't guarantee they'll all be the same. A cluster is they're all going to be the same machine. The picture you saw on the front slide was a cluster. They're all exactly the same, and it makes it much, much easier to program a system which they're all the same. Okay. By the way, it's not about solving things faster. The previous slide said it's about solving a big problem at all. It's not, well, can I load Word or can I do this small thing much faster? I don't need that. It's about this massive problem that I could not even approach if I didn't have the help of everybody in the room's computer together. Okay? And that would be a grid because they'd be all be different. So here are the themes. We're going to be trying to make this happen. So our very, very common theme is there is a dispatcher and workers. This is like the taxi model. So taxi, there's a dispatcher who manages all the taxis of San Francisco. And they know who needs to go to where. And they're calling up and saying, OK, car 47, is somebody waiting for you at this corner? Meet them there. They're taking them to the airport. OK. That dispatcher sends stuff out. Exactly the same thing happens in the computer side. Dispatcher says, OK, you have this big problem. My job is to break it up into lots of chunks, know what my workers can do, know what their capacities are, know how long it should roughly take. Divide it up more if I need to do that. Send it off and keep track of how the work is doing. Hey, car 57, are you still okay? Nope, got a flat. Well, I need to know that as dispatcher to do what? <coughs> to send another cab to pick up that person to get to the airport on time. The same thing on the computer. If one machine is down and I'm saying, hello, hey, machine 47, how you doing? Machine 47, machine 47. Crickets, crickets, crickets. <laughs> I need to realize machine 47 is hosed. And to say, I'm going to give up on machine 47 and restart that computation with, with another machine. And make up, wake up another machine and say, here's machine 47's work that I gave it to him. You do it because machine 47 has died because of a disk error or, or power went out in that machine. Whatever. There's a lot of things that could go wrong in this computation. Or the network went out. It could be, I got the data, but the network went out between 47 and me. A, couple, a lot of things could go wrong in that process. Some examples of this, by the way, are SETI at home. How many of you know about SETI at home? Wow, this, everyone hand in that room used to go up 10 years ago. SETI at home is a study for uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. At home meant that people are using their home computers in their, um, it used to be screensavers were a big deal. Now people just have, like, it goes black or something. But in the old days, they used to have spinning things and swirly things. Ooh, swirlies. And they'd have things that they would use for their screensavers. 
SETI at home was, hey, rather than have just randomly make a swirly thing and use up your CPU as it's changing the color of this thing, why not have you grab a workload unit from this main center, crunch a little bit on the signal processing aspect, looking for spikes and signals, looking for you know, a radio signal from another planet saying, broadcasting their television stations to us or something, and looking for signal patterns that are not terrestrial signal patterns, and saying, you know, that is an intelligent life form because that signal pattern was not, did not emanate from, the, from the, this world, did not emanate from anywhere in this, in this planet, and it's unique. And I'm receiving data from, this, from exactly that star right there. And somehow that's a language. That's intelligence. That would be so exciting. Mean, in my lifetime, I hope we either find it. It's not, you can't really disprove it. It's kind of like you, know, you either find it or you don't find it. So I hope we do find it because I don't think we're alone. And it's exciting to know that people are actively trying to help that process of doing it. And it might be discovered by your laptop. Isn't that incredible that your laptop might be the first people I think that's incredibly empowering that your laptop crunching on some random signal from some radio telescope says, wait, there's a spike here. All of a sudden, that bubbles up. To, now, let, let's double check and confirm. Now, let's just have 100 laptops checking. Oh, they all confirm that there is a signal coming from that, that, that planet that was not from the terrestrial, terrestrial, of, terrestrial origin. Pretty cool stuff. So what are the challenges of going parallel? Well, it's not as easy as you, even if you have a cluster of all identical machines, it's not that easy because you have all the problems of the machines have their own network, they have their own memory. You have to get the data to them in a clean way. What if machines, it's a shared resource. How do you divide up the, how do, your data file might not divide up very easily. Sometimes it does. Well, if you're shuffling cards, I can give you 10 cards, shuffle them into a nice order, bring them back to me, I can maybe sort them there. But sometimes it doesn't, sometimes you need all the data at once to do some kind of analysis on the whole thing. That's really hard to ship this massive set of data to everybody, so that's hard. You really want to have things that are embarrassing. This is write this down. Embarrassingly parallel. An embarrassingly parallel task is one in which it just trivially decompresses to all the things. The amount of shared resources is almost zero. So each person can sit, so kind, of, kind of independently work on their chunk, kind of like SETI at home. I'm given a little bit of chunk of radio telescope data. I need to like process it and give it back to you. I don't have to have the whole set of the whole radio telescope data over the whole year. I just kind of have my one five minutes of samples and work on that to try to find some peaks in the signal processing domain, OK? So the key thing is you're looking for problems whose compute times are much greater than the overhead. What is overhead? The overhead of dividing the problem up, shipping it out to your person, then getting the data back to them and kind of putting it back in a, in a, in a clever way that all makes sense. That's overhead. And you hope is that the compute times are bigger than your overhead. Otherwise, it's like package it up, ship it over, boom, done, back. And all of a sudden, it's all this overhead. You don't really have a win. Okay, You want to have a win when the compute time is much bigger than your overhead. Like, for example, rendering this picture. I, this picture is not just a fluffy picture. This picture is Pixar needing a massive render farm. And no way are they going to use a cloud where it's someone else's, like Amazon's, because that's their intellectual property. There's no way that, that each pixel, that, that geometry for that, that those characters are their whole intellectual property. That's their whole money-making thing. If they were to lose that data for that gentleman, they'd be in trouble. Okay? So they can never lose that data or let somebody else steal it. So they have to keep it internal. So they have their own cluster. And that, obviously, it's a cluster, not a grid, because it's their own system. It's all the same. And the amount of work to do this is basically, here's all the geometry I need. My job is to render that pixel. I could have an entire machine who works for a day. Isn't this incredible? a day to generate that pixel. And it's blue, bluish. A day goes by, and that machine says, bluish. You know how much a machine costs to keep it on, powered, blah, blah, blah? And all it did was return one three vectored number, red, green, and blue. Bluish, right there. And, that's what, and you, you, you basically take your data set, your geometry, you pass it to all the machines, and they all are given a small little window in that huge, high-definition, 4K, however big they render it to, picture, and they rep they rep that machine is responsible only for that little window of, of, of the screen, of the image. Isn't that cool? So that's an embarrassingly parallel job, right? Big chunk, and I'm just responsible for this guy. I don't care where my neighbors are, because my pixels aren't being affected by them. Isn't that kind of smart? Cool. So what can we think about a, what we need to do is come up together with an abstraction that can make it easy to program a million machines. That would be really hard. They're all different. I've got to type, OK, ready? Go. Go with data set equals 7. 
Go with data set equals 12. And I'm typing this a million times? No, there's got to be a simpler way to, to add this run on a million machines. And be able to handle when a machine fail, fails, and be able to handle when one machine is way slower than the others. So the one machine is really fast, returns its chunk fast. Because maybe in this picture, there's nothing up there. There's no geometry. So the guy says, oh, blue. It's background, because there's no geometry there. That was easy. The machine's sitting idle, waiting for more work. So it's the job of the dispatcher to figure out, OK, you are idle. Let me give you some more work. How about these pixels? Think you're so smart? Smarty Alec machine. How about these pixels? And you give them right, right in the middle of the balloon. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. So balloons, right? OK. So here is higher order functions. Higher order functions come to the rescue, because we're going to use higher order functions. We're going to see that many people have turned to a particularly beautiful abstraction called MapReduce. Map, as you saw for a week, and combine, which is kind of like reduce. We call them reduce because it's a little different than combine. Why is it different? Because combine was always left associative. When I say the word combine, it's all, I guarantee it's always like this. Combine on four, a four input list on that function will always be the nested blocks in the bottom. This is all review, by the way. Combine will always be that way. Reduce is not necessarily that way, left associative. It could be right associative. It could be any pairings to get to a single winner. Okay. This is it. This is the most complicated slide of the lecture. So I'm going to spend some time talking about this, as well as doing a demo. Okay. So imagine at the beginning of the semester, we talked about programming paradigms, different ways that you can program a computer. And the four ways were, let's see if you remember all four of them. Four ways were functional. Good, I'm getting, your, getting, the, getting the ball rolling. Functional, that's one of them, right? Object-oriented, object good. Object-oriented? Imperative, good. And declarative or logic. Excellent, those are the four, OK? Now, of those four, are any of them kind of nice for parallel programming? Functional. That was, I think, on the quest. Functional, OK? So why is functional so nice for parallel programming? There's no, who said that? What's your name again? Michael. Michael. Home run. That's the best question so far. No state. There's no state. The output of a function is only a function of its input. It's not a function of any other prior information. So guess what? What do you smell? Here's a map. Here's a map over, remember this map? Here's a map. Here's a map of reporter, like plus one, over the list, which is a million things long. Do you smell embarrassingly parallel? I smell it. Do you smell it? Because each computation of the plus one happens only on that list element. It doesn't happen to anybody else. It doesn't happen on the whole. You don't need the whole list to do it, like reduce does. Reduce needs the whole thing to get your answer. But map is, I'm taking this whole vector, which is a million elements long. Could be the age of everybody in the United States. And guess what? It's now the next year, so I have to, they got older by one year. So I have to add their one to every number. So I take this million thing long, and then bloop, plus one for everybody. So each machine gets only the age of person number 437. And they then add one and return that value. Embarrassingly parallel. So people turn to functional programming when they went parallel because they said, look, it's embarrassingly parallel. That map can be divided up and perfectly parallelized with no weight of anything, no kind of dependency on neighbor data. Right? Powerful idea. So that's the mapping part. What's the reducing part? Combine is this left associative thing, which takes how many stages? Here's a list of four things. How many stages does it take? One, and this guy has to wait for AB to finish. Then that's two. This guy has, has to wait for ABC to finish, and then D. Or in general, if I have a list of n things, how long does this take? What's the running time of combine? Oh, good final exam question. And minus one or go ahead. Linear. What's your name? Eric. Eric. Linear. Exactly right. Linear. And minus one is like n, as, as n grows really big. That's linear. That's terrible. Can anybody think of here are four things? A final four. Hi, can anybody think of a better way to 
kind of patch these things up if the function f were associative and commutative, which means I can change the order and change how they're parenthesized. If it is, like multiplication, addition, okay, and, or, okay, if it were like that, can you think of a better way to kind of pair up A, B, C, D using this kind of two input, one output function? Okay, A fights B, and then there's output of F of A, B. What else would you do next? Final four, basketball fans, anybody? Group them F of C, D, and then you have the winner of this the Eastern Regional and the Western Regional. And then they would fight together, and you'd have F of F of AB versus F of CD. See that binary tree? Well, guess what? If you extend that binary tree, what do you get? Binary tree, think binary, what's the order of growth of that? Logarithmic. That's awesome. So you go from, if I give you, oh, I don't know, if I give you a million objects, Linear says it's going to take a million times, roughly. What's logarithmic say? Let me know what log base 2 of a million is, roughly. That's a tough one. I do. And I do because I can reverse it, because I know that 2 to the blick is around that, so that's how I know the thing. I can, I can teach you how to do this pretty fast. 2 to the 10th is 1,000. 2 to the 20th is a million. So it's 20. I went from a million computations to 20. If I have the first round, all of them are you know, paired together in pairs, like, that, like an NCAA tournament. And then the next day, the next step, those million became 500,000. And guess what? They became a quarter million. They became an eighth of a million. And 20 stages later, guess what? I'm at one answer. That's only if it's commutative and associative. If I'm adding things up, it doesn't matter how I add them up, it's all just going to work, right? It doesn't matter whether I add them up left to right or pair them like this, it's going to work. That's powerful, powerful stuff. So here's the idea. The big idea in this, in this particular lecture is that MapReduce, combine is always left associative, but reduce, when I pass in a reducer, I'm passing in a associative and commutative reducer. Why? Because that guy is going to be sent out to many machines. And I don't have any idea in advance when those machines are going to come back. And I want also the machines to be maximally utilized and to be as fast as possible. So rather than think of a combine, which is a linear step, I go with the reducer, which is this kind of fan out binary pairing. And I notice I have, here's four guys, they become two guys, they become one guy, and it keeps dividing by two. So in 20 steps, in the ideal case, I'd have my answer. Isn't that cool? If I had a billion, how many steps would it take me? 30 steps. A trillion? 40 steps. I can count them. There's 40 people in this room. I'm, you're, you're telling me I'm operating on a trillion data, data objects, and yet it only takes 40 steps, 40 clock cycles? Yes. That's, what's, that's how beautiful logarithmic growth is. We love logarithmic growth because it means that those machines are being maximally utilized. It's really, really cool. So that's why this works, folks. If I give you n things in a list to process on a map reduce, in the ideal case, how long does the map take? It's embarrassingly parallel. All of them start at the same time, finish at the same time. How long does it take? One time step. It's independent of the size of that list because I'll just have enough machines. If you give me a million things on my this, a million people to add. Here's a perfect example, sum of squares. I want you to be able to take all the ages of this, a million people. I need to square each of those numbers because I'm doing some calculation that has some, you know, actuary benefits, so I have to square their ages, you know, the actuary for the insurance. Okay, so I square their ages, right? And then I need to add it together to, some, to see how, like, how healthy a society is or whatever. I don't know, okay, right? Okay, sum of squares on a million numbers. It would normally take me how long? In a normal one machine, it would take me a million steps to go through the first time, 
to square them all. If I just have one machine, one, my laptop, Sam, and you only have your laptop. Okay, a million to square them all, and then a million to add them all together. Two million, what's two million? Order of growth? Sorry, what's n times the first time, n times the second time, that's n plus n is 2n. What's 2n? Linear. So it'd be a linear problem, right? It'd be basically two times that. It'd take me 2,000 time steps. Now I have a million computers to help me. Check this out. The map phase is handed out to all the million machines at once. Okay, so let's assume my, my network is fast enough to do that. Boom, now all people in this room are going to help with the problem, okay? Ready? Square your number. Go, square your number, okay? Good, you square your number. That took one time step. That was constant, folks. Constant time. That's cool. <laughs> Linear, a million steps versus one. That's pretty powerful. Now, let's all add them together. How do I do that? Efficiently. Do I go to combine? No, I do reduce which is everybody turn to their neighbors, and like peer instruction, add your sum to your neighbors. Okay, go. Okay, now I have, if I have, now I only have half a million numbers. Okay, now that group of two, find another group of two, and add them together. Boom. Now I only have a quarter million numbers. 20 steps later, I'm done. I went from 2 million steps, a million the first time to square them all, a million to add them all together, to 20 plus the one map step is 21 steps. Do you guys realize how cool that is? Imagine a massive problem, climate simulation. You would be taking forever to do it on one machine, but because you have embarrassingly parallel problems and you have this beautiful map-produced abstraction, I send it out, you do the map in one time step, and then you all kind of do this tree of NCAA tournament to pair each other up. You, you pair up with two, and then they pair up with four, and then pair up with eight, until that finally one person's representative says, I have your number, and they kneel, and they say, I have your number, Dan. And they hand me the number, I look at it, and that's the answer of the sum of squares of a million numbers in 21 time steps. That's awesome. Constant plus quadratic, constant plus logarithmic equals logarithmic. The constant washes away. So I went from a linear to a logarithmic process. 2 million to 21. That's pretty powerful. That's amazing, okay? So you are going to be doing this. You're going to be feeling the power of this MapReduce paradigm. But guess what? It's exactly like you did. Let me see how many times doing. Four, five minutes. It's exactly like you did last week. It's just a mapper and a combiner, except your combiner has to now be not assuming it's left associative. It has to be more general, okay? So how would this be? How would MapReduce over a sum of squares be? This is what it looks like. Map of times, reduce of plus over this list. You're done. That's sum of squares in MapReduce. If that list were 1 million long, and this were connected to a cluster of a million machines, this would take 21 time steps, which in my computer, computer's term working you know, nanosecond level is instantaneous. That's, isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing to me. Okay? So, how does this work? You have a mapping. The mapping does everything at once. So it takes the one, squares it to that. 20, by the way, this is supposed to be, the mapper is supposed to be a one input. It's a function of one argument. This, we have a special cool feature in BYOB, which is if you pass in a guy from two arguments, I'll just copy the, the same value twice. So you kind of get square for free. You kind of get that? I don't mean to confuse you. The mapper is a function of one argument, right? Because it's 1 becomes 1, 20 becomes 400, right? So it's a function of one argument. I'm happy to use this times thing, which is really square, okay? Because of that, that cool thing. So what's cool is I actually only have, watch this. I come out with the white number, which is the input, right? Input, 1, 20, 3, and 10. Then I have the output of the mappers which is like 1, 400, 9, and 100, which is the square of each of those guys, right? Then those guys have to be passed to the reducer who themselves are inputs to another reducer. You get that? So because these plugs have to work like this, the, the style of output, the kind of format of the output of a mapper has to be exactly the same as the input to the reducer. Does that make sense? Because that's why these two guys are plugging into each other. The output of the mapper goes to the input of the reducer, right? 
So it has to be the same format. Whatever kind of format you have, a list of this, of this, has to be the same format. And guess what? The output of the reducer is also passed into the input of the reducer. See, the, see how this arrow? Look at this arrow right here. Right, let me move my, move my cursor. See this arrow? That's the output of a reducer, which is passed into the input of another reducer. Therefore, all those things in yellow are the same thing, which means the input to the mapper is one kind of style of input, one, f f one data abstraction. And the output of the mapper is equal to the input of the reducer, is equal to the output of the reducer, which is the other. So there's only two kinds of things you want. Input of the whole thing and the output of the whole thing. That's all you need to worry about. Okay? The reducer's input better be the same as its output. Okay. So, MapReduce allows for amazing advantages. You can program. It's really fast. It manages all the difficulty of networks going down, machines crashing. It's awesome. Full MapReduce is what they use at Google, and they use it for all of their main big projects. Um, and in summary, MapReduce is incredible. 